The Four Room Rug by Kate Douglas Wiggin. Diadem, a wife of Jot Bascom, was sitting at the window of a village watchtower, so called because it commanded a view of nearly everything that happened in Pleasant River, those details escaping the physical eye, being supplied by faith and imagination, working in the light of past experience. She sat in the choir, the chair of honor, the chair of choice, the high backed rocker by the southern window in which her husband's mother, old Mrs. Bascom, had sat for thirty years, applying still more powerful intellectual telescope to the doings of her neighbors. Diadema's seat had formerly been of the less desirable side of the light, the little light stand, where Priscilla Hollis was now installed. Mrs. Bascom was at work on a new four-room rug, the former one having been transferred to Miss Hollis's chamber, for as the teacher at the Brick Schoolhouse, a graduate of Massachusetts Normal School and the daughter of a deceased judge. She was a boarder of considerable consequence. It was a rainy Saturday afternoon, and the two women were alone in this pleasant, peaceful sitting room, as neat as wax in every part. The floor was covered by a cheerful, patriotic rag carpet woven entirely of red, white, and blue rags, and protected in various exposed localities by bottom rugs red, white, and blue discs and superimposed one on the other. Diadema Bascom was a person of some sentiment. When her old father, Captain Dinette, was dying, he drew a wallet from under his pillow and handed her a $20 bill to get something to remember him by. This unwanted occurrence burned, himself, burned itself into the daughter's imagination, and when she came as a bride to Bascom House, she refurnished the sitting room as a kind of monument to the departed soldier, whose sword and musket were now tied to the wall. With neatly hammed bows and bright red cotton, the chair cushions were red and white glazed patched. The turkey wings that served as hearth brushes were hung against the white painted chimney piece with a blue skirt braid, and the white shades were finished with homemade scarlet tassels, a little whatnot. In one corner was laden with the trophies of battle. The warrior's brass buttons were strung on a red picture cord and hung over the damaresque type of the upper shelf. There was a tarnished shoulder strap, a flattened bullet with the captain's jealous contemporaries swore he never stopped unless he got in it in the rear when he was flying from the foe. There was also a little tin canister in which a charge of powder has been sacredly preserved. The scoffers again said that the captain in his musket when he went into the war and kept it there till he come home. These objects were tastefully decorated with the national colors. In fact, no modern aesthete could have arranged a symbolic symphony of grief and glory with any more fidelity to an ideal than Diadema Bascon in working out her scheme of red, white, and blue. Rows of ripened tomatoes lay along the ledges of the windows, and a tortoiseshell cat on one of the broad sills. The tall clock on the corner ticked peacefully. Priscilla Hollis, never tired of looking at the jolly red-checked moon, the group of stars on a blue ground, the trig little ship, the old house, and the jolly moon again creeping one after another across the open space at the top. Jot Bascom was out, as usual, gathering statistics of the last horse trade. Little Jot was bullish building stick in houses in the barn. Priscilla was sewing long strips for braiding, and Diadema sat in the drawing in frame, hook in hand, and a large basket of cut rags by her side. Not many weeks before she had paid one of her periodical visits to the attic. No housekeeper in Pleasant River, save Mrs. Jonathan Biscom, would have thought of dusting the gar a garret, washing the window, and sweeping down the cobwebs once a month, renewing the camphor's bags in chests twice a year. But notwithstanding this zealous care, the moths had made their way into one of her treasure houses, the most precious of all, the old hair trunk that had belonged to his to his sister Lovis, once esconded there, they had eaten through the hoarded relics, reduced the fate of finery to the state best described by Diadema as regular ridden sleeves. She had brought 
the tattered pile down into the kitchen, and I'd spent a tearful afternoon in cutting the good pieces from the perforated garments, three heaped up baskets, and a full dishpan were the result, and as she had snipped and cut and sorted, one of her sentimental projects had entered her mind and taken complete possession there. I declare, she said, as she drew her hooking needle in and out. I wouldn't sit in the room with some folks and work on these pieces. For every time I draw on a scrap of cloth, Lovis comes up to me for all the world as if she was setting on the lofty, th on, on the sofa there. I ain't told you my plan, Miss Hollis, and there ain't many I shall tell. But this rug is going to be kind of history of my life, and Lovis wrought in together. Just as he was bound up in one another when she was alive, her things and mine was laid in one trunk, and the moths shan't cheat me out of it together. If I can't look at him on Wednesdays, I mean Saturdays, I mean Sundays, and shake him out, and a good cry over him, I'll make him into a kind of dumb show that will mean something to me, if it don't to anybody else. We was the youngest of thirteen, Lovey and I, and we has we was twins. There's never been more than half of me left since she died. We was born together, played and went to school together, and got engaged and married together. We all di we all but died together. We wasn't a mite alike. There was an old lady come to our house once that used to say, There's sister Nabby now, and she and I ain't more alike if we weren't to. She's just as different as I to other way. Well, I know I want to put into my rag story, Miss Hollis. I don't hardly know where how to begin. Priscilla dropped her needle and bent over the frame with interest. A spray of two roses in the center. There's the beginning. Why don't you see, dear Mrs. Bascom? Of course I do, said Diadema, diving into the bottom of the dishpan. I got my start now, and don't you say a word for a minute. The two roses grow out of one stalk. They'll be lovey and me, though I'm considerable more like a potato blossom. The stalk's got to be green. Here is the very green silk mother walked bright in. Lovey and I had roundabouts in, in afterwards. She had the chicken pox where... I can't finish the story again. I, I, I don't know why I keep starting these stories and can't finishing them. I think I need to read shorter short stories. Um, I think... I think I'm... I don't know. I like I. I really struggle with reading this stuff, and I don't know. It's it's maybe like the writing is not very good, or I don't know. I'm. I I don't know what I want to do with this because it, it's kind of like. I I I have a really short attention span, so I. I don't. Maybe. Maybe I'm just looking for something else. I don't know what I'm looking for. Um, let me know in the comments below what did you think of the segment of the story that I read. And please subscribe to this channel to be part of the community. And please like this video. It really helps the channel out a lot. Um, yeah, my attention span is really low. I, I don't know if... I guess I'm going to keep starting stories and not finish them. Maybe I'll find some shorter stories somewhere. Let me know in the comments below. Um, what you thought of it. Please subscribe to this channel to be part of the community and please like this video. It really helps the channel out a lot. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Bye bye.